as an assembly, what their job was, was they understood they were setting up the second temple. They were aware prophetically, you know, they wanted to make it be the last thing on. They knew that was going to be destroyed and this would be a long exile. They knew that. They knew that from back from Moshe. And even if you look in the book of Daniel, you understand that the 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 um the other exiles would be a short exiles compared to the the um, Roman exile, which was going to be thousands of years. So so what happened was they did have to go. They also knew it was the end of prophecy. So they had to structure things in a way that it would be able to Judaism can maintain. I know I'm saying the word Judaism, but the Torah meaning that God's command of how Jews would live would be able to continue when they would be in exile for so long. There would not be a temple for very long for so long. So the idea of synagogues to get together in a place of serving God and even the prayers because. Before the men of the great assembly, prayer right. prayer was an individual. People went to the prophet. No, there was, there was prayer. There was prayer, and there isn't even discussion. According to Maimonides, it's an obligation to pray every day, but it wasn't structured in a way that it had the words to say. And rather, what it was was that the people had their own expression. And it came out very much in it as 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 a as a sort of a continuation of the service in the temple. The service in the temple was the primary thing, and prayer was when a person needed, he was in pain, called out. And people we and this I, I made a comment about this last week to realize the people of of the first temple time, even though you read in the book of Kings all the problems that were going on. They were a completely different level than later on. Mm. Remember, the men of the Great Assembly are the end <laughs> of the prophets. That means before that, prophecy was very common. So for a person to make up his own prayer is a very specific thing and a very uh, possible thing. Once the men of the Great Assembly realized that prophecy would be lost, <laughs> they structured the prayer in a way using prophecy measuring each and every word exactly that everyone for the next thousands of years when they would use the the structure the prophets set up as jewish prayer it would fix the world along the whole process you wow. couldn't do that today a guy writes a private writes a prayer today oh yeah you know please god let us let us let our team win i mean it's like what what are we saying we're not like you know they would say they were prophets and they were taking the ideas and that's why I mean, even now, and 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 you know, we're learning in, in my uh, my yeshiva in our kola in, in Israel, we're actually learning some of the 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 the, the Kabbalist understandings of the prayers. It's endless, endless. It's, it's 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 literally, and that that was had to be set into motion by people when they still had prophecy. So the point you're saying has a lot of truth to it. That that the men of the great assembly. And this whole transition period of time was a critical preparation for the second commonwealth from the second temple, but it was also the preparation for the long exile until the Mashiach comes. That is true. Yeah. Okay, so let me, uh, we'll, we'll jump in and I'll answer some of these points right now. And as we said, what we want to do with this series a little bit is talk a little bit about, you know, uh, politics is a, uh, you know, politics is fun, something that no one feels good at the end after discussing. That's the problem. You know? <laughs> like, like, like at the Shabbat table, we like to talk about holy things. Some reason, prop, you know, politics, not politics, I want to feel. Uh, but I, I, I have to say some of the things, and I'm, I'm going to say them, you know, in as a, uh, um, I guess, as gentle as way I can, because um, you really have to be aware of what's going on. I mean, this, this the stuff that's happening right now in the world is very serious. And so I, I do want to refer to some of the things that are happening in the world and what we could do about them. And, and like I said a couple weeks ago, and really to be aware, because like, I don't know, you know, if you, I'm sure you all heard about the, uh, the Durham report about the FBI. Now, I didn't read the 300 and whatever pages of it was. I didn't read the whole thing. But 
And I, you know, I've heard all yeah. parts of it. And I, unfortunately, I wasn't surprised by any of it. I probably no one on this, on this class was surprised by what's going on. There, there is a, a, a things that are happening right now that, which I've been trying to sort of, you know, warn everybody about, which is that there is, there is straight out lies that is being propagated. And, and they're so bizarre. But like, you know, you, as I said many times, you can't go and tell, you know, if, you know, we talked about last time, you know, and the coronavirus start. Well, you, if you would have said it started in the place where there was the laboratory, that the NIH was paying for corona research, you're a conspiracy theorist. So like, it, it means that no one can think anymore. So now, if, 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 you, if you tell me a man is a woman, a woman's a man, and I question that, oh, 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 oh. So you we're living in a world of dystopia that that polarized down yeah. and down is up and 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 the crazy part is you can't you can't question it you're a racist or this or that but you must you must question it you must realize that that you're everything you're being told you must stay with a grain of salt and I'm trying to show it to you for, that this is not a new story it's only a new story because you know we especially people who lived in America. Uh, had some pride in America for many years that that you know everything was being done hopefully on the side of right was it well how much where not as you know as, as obvious we might have people might have thought but now a lot of this stuff is just coming out and and we really have to keep our eyes open and and see this in in a certain uh, global process of history that's what I want to do I want us to see it. I, I will touch back on the politics a little bit um, because there's it, nothing new. You know, it's like uh, there actually is a commandment in the Torah to learn learn history. It says in the uh, in in, in the, uh, the chapter of Hazinu, it says Zachor, you must all remember the the days that happened prior because you need to understand what's happening. Okay, the person understands that God created the world, Jews out of Egypt. This has happened. That happened. These processes, repeat, history repeats itself. And, and the, the players change, but uh, most of the themes of what people do repeat themselves. And the grand plan is in motion, and it will happen by hook or crook. So let's jump in today to Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah. Now, the book of Nehemiah from the very beginning uh, I'm sorry, I don't know how to say it in English. I'm just going to say Nehemiah. Uh, uh, Dan, you were saying before, how'd you say it? Nehemiah. Nehemiah, okay. I'm going to stick with Nehemiah, just, just easier for me. But, but the book of Nehemiah, when you start out already, has a big issue. And the big issue is, is that there are 24 books of the written Torah, of the Tanakh, and Nehemiah is not one of them, meaning... That Nehemiah is part of the book of Ezra. And there's a famous question the sages ask that why was the book of, of Ezra and Nehemiah just called Ezra? Because we're starting now in chapter one in Nehemiah, which is says, these are the words of Nehemiah ben Hachiloya. And, and Rashi says, from now the rest of the book is Nehemiah writing this. So Ezra wrote before, but now it's Nehemiah. But the book is called technically the book of Ezra. That's what it was always called. Why wasn't it called Nehemiah? It was it's one book, even though today people talk about it as two books. And even the Jewish people, they talk about it as two books, but it's really not. It's one and the same book. It's all called the book of Ezra. Why? Why not Nehemiah? I mean, most of, the, most of the parts are going to be now Nehemiah writing. Ezra had 10 chapters. I mean, 13 chapters written by Nehemiah. So why is it called Ezra? So there's various reasons given. One reason is very fascinating. And, and these I want to explain to you why I'm, I'm telling you these ideas, because there are two reasons, the main reasons that are given. One is at the end of the book of Nehemiah, he writes there, he says the following line. I'll read the last the last verse in the Hemia says, Remember me, God, for good, for the good, the good things that I did. 
seemingly very innocuous statement. Remember all the good things I did? That, on the level of Nehemia, is called a flaw. Because we always see the righteous people don't take credit for themselves. So to say, remember the forefathers, remember all those things, that is the way of the prayer of the great leaders of Jewish people. But to go and to say, remember what I did for good, that is a little bit of a fine point. You know, I understand it's not so bad. He did a lot of great things. He really did. He he enacted many things that are as 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 we were saying earlier, and it's going to propel and 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 move the Jewish people for the next thousands of years of exile. But in the end of the book, when he sends the line, "Remember me for good," so that is is a line that shows that it was inappropriate to say something to take credit. There's another place in the book of, ne- of Nehemiah where he says about some of the what he did as opposed to some of the previous leaders did. And that also to say, just say, was an implication of putting them down to a certain degree. It's very subtle. But that also is a, um, uh, there's a critique on Nehemiah with, I want to explain this as, a, as an assignment. Because you listen, in, in, in other religions, they have these ideas of the saint. The saint. And in the Torah, when you see a person that does something wrong, it does not matter who they are, what they are, but they will be held accountable. There's no free pass because the guy, guy's got a long white beard and, he, and, and he's, there's no free pass. King David was the greatest of the great. And, and ladies and gentlemen, when you read the story of King David, most people will assume that he committed adultery, which God forbid he did not. He didn't do that. So what happened? Why did he do that? Because he did an inappropriate thing. It's true. However, it wasn't adultery. There's two reasons why it wasn't adultery, which go hand in hand. One is that there was a law that when the people went out to war, they actually would divorce their wives first. And the reason for that was if someone was missing an action, the wife couldn't get remarried because they wouldn't know if the husband was dead or alive. So that would be the terrible, terrible situation called an aguna, a woman who was stuck now, didn't know if her husband was dead or alive. So the, the, the custom was that, that to get divorced. So actually, Bathsheba, the story of David, she was actually divorced. Furthermore, there's a story there that, 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 that says in the Talmud that her husband, Riafiti, was obligated to death sentence. He, 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 he was rebellious against the king in various ways, the Talmud, the Talmud says. And therefore, he, wasn't, he was considered to be like a dead person. He was divorced and he was not going to have any more life. Furthermore, as another side to understand, it says that Bathsheba, the person that, sh- that King David took, it really was his soulmate. He just jumped the gun. Should have waited. After Uriah would have, been, would have died and the whole thing would have played out. He would have married this woman properly. He did it. He is held accountable. So much so that it sounds like he committed adultery. Because it's, it looks that way. So he's not put under the nice light. Oh, you know, it really, I have to tell you this based on the Talmud that says really, but the Torah itself holds him accountable. It was wrong what you did. It doesn't give him any, you know, like ways out. Oh, really? It was just a bad hair day or whatever. I, it doesn't do that. It says you did the wrong thing. It's true for everyone. If you read even the story of, of, of Reuven, King, the son of, 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 of Yaakov, it sounds like he had relations with his father's uh, uh, wife. And it's not, it's not what happened. Text says no, it's not what happened. But actually, another story, he prevented his father from being with his, 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 his wife because he moved the beds. He was jealous for his mother, a whole story. But, he actually, but the text says it in a way to hold him accountable. And the reason for that is, and I want to explain this to you to so understand this, because this, this might be frightening for us. It says that God judges the righteous people with, with a, at a very exacting way. Now, why is that? 
I would think if they're so righteous, they should get a break. The answer is no. The answer is the reason why the righteous get judged very, very exact things because they want to be. Why do they want? Because what's the purpose in life? The purpose in life is to earn our connection to God. It is to do the mitzvot, do the right things in order that we came to this world for a purpose. It wasn't a freebie. If God just wanted to give you all of the goodness he has in store for eternity, he would have just started with eternity. He put us into a world that has work. And the work in this world is that a person should bring out their greatness and bring out their righteousness. So when I start to go and I, I let you sort of not act so good, but I, I, I say, no, it's okay, it doesn't matter, that I'm actually diluting the purpose. Mm. So now if you're a person, when you're starting out, there's much compassion. It says there are three things that God does that is, is, is this expression of, of this incredible rachamim compassion. One is when you do something wrong, you don't get knocked out right away. Technically, you know, if a person would go and, and rebel against a king who had the right to kill a person, they'd kill him on the spot. So when a person rebels against God, he doesn't punish him right away. This is faith. Then what happens is, he, he, he doesn't, uh, God will, will the, the, the punishment may be small thing, little things to pay it off. Doesn't happen right away. It doesn't happen completely. And then there's the concept of doing tshuva, of returning. Those three things are built into the system that a person has the ability to go and to, and to develop from where they are and slowly, slowly get greater. I'll give me an example. I'm playing you. I want you to. I want to train you to become an expert tennis player. So now, if I'm a pro and I start taking the ball, I smash. You never played before, and I smash. And I hit you. I hit the ball so hard. You're not going to know how to do anything. Right. It's a bad beat. Bad, bad does not work. Now, so what do I do in the beginning? I, I give you some. I give you some slack. Okay, you know, hit you hit it into the doubles lane. Okay, I'm not going to call it out. You know, it bounced maybe two... You just started the first game, bounced two times near side. I'm not going to say anything. I got to give you the space. But the goal is not to stay like that. I've been playing for 10 years and still bouncing three times in your side. That's not good. So when you get really efficient, that's when the righteous people want to be judged strictly because they don't want the kindness to dilute their own ability to be accurate and be, in this example, professional, professional at life. Mm. So that means that's what happened with Nehemia. Nehemia was the greatest of the great. We'll see what he did. He did things that were, were so fantastic for the people. But, but a little of a step of, of saying something that is, sounds like you give yourself credit or, or sounds like you're putting someone else down. You don't mean it, but that for a great person is inappropriate. So that's what the same to say why it's not called the book of of Nehemiah's book of Ezra. But then I have a question. So I don't understand. So so today people seem to be calling it Nehemiah very often. Jewish people call it Nehemiah also. And in, in my in the book I'm using right now, they called it Ezra and Nehemiah. Very interesting how that evolved like that. I saw one commentary say that that over the years, the flaw that Nehemiah did, taking credit or or uh, of, of, of seeming to elevate himself and say that other people didn't do it the way he did, that already had been fixed up. In his and that's a very important thing to understand also. When a person is judged, there's different times they're judged in their life. Is Rosh Hashanah every year? Every year, the word Shana in Hebrew means a cycle. Rosh Hashanah, the word Shana is to repeat a cycle. It actually is the numerical value of 354 55 days, which is the lunar calendar. 
So, and Rosh Hashanah, everyone is judged. The second time everyone is judged is the day they die. Second time. The third time the person is judged is the day of the final judgment. Everything comes to complete. So it kind of makes us wonder. The guy was judged. He lived 120 years. He did this and this and this and this. Then he died. He's judged. Now, let's say the day of great judgment is now, let's say, I don't know, in another 100 years. Stay tomorrow, but it, but it's a little a hundred years. So, what are they going to judge him in another hundred years? They say, well, he was still dead, you know, like <laughs> he was lying there dead for a hundred years. So what? So what's going to be different in the judgment a hundred years later on the day of great judgment when the world comes to its completion? How can he have a different judgment than the day he died? He's still been dead. Any other question? Are you hearing the question? You can't judge him every time. You judge him. How do you judge him? With the, the answer is because the things you build in life have effects even after a person leaves this world. You train your child to live righteously. The child does good things. You get credit. You help somebody out. You do something good for somebody. They end up doing more good things. The, the things you put into motion in your life you don't necessarily even see them all in your life. I, I know I told you the story, but I'll just say it again as an example. A friend of mine who 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 is a is a is a Torah teacher in in uh, Montreal, and uh, he told me when he was a kid he, he wasn't raised a religious Jewish person, and he started going to the synagogue. He went there once, but like no one no one paid attention to him. Everyone was busy there all thing. No one said a lot. He went a second time. Also, no one. He said the third time. He said, "If someone doesn't come and say hello to me, I'm never coming back." You know, I don't know. He was 13 years old, whatever he was. And the third time, some guy, someone came up and said, "I see you've been coming the past few weeks. What's your name? Nice to meet you." And then he kept coming. Eventually, became a rabbi. All the people he helps are going to be also credited. The guy who said hello to him in the synagogue. Because he actually did something good that's producing fruit for, for years. So that's why there could be a judgment at the end of time also, because even though a person dies, the things are set into motion, the good things, hopefully, they are still playing out. And so I saw some commentary saying that it could be that Nehemia. That even though there was a slight flaw in 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 the in the way he said things, but the time that 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 sort of decree was for him has passed. Through. Great. Okay. Good questions, comments, thoughts so far. Make sense? Not make sense? Ideas? Larry had a question. Yeah. Rabbi. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Lara first. Yeah. I just want to. Um, uh, go over the uh, three judgments, if you don't mind. Sure. So the first one is in Rosh Hashanah. Right. Is that only for Jewish people That's or everybody. Gentiles included? Everybody. 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 The second judgment is the day we die. So that will be up to that point. Right. Everybody. Right? Yep. And then the third judgment is all the consequences of our actions, our words, whatever we have caused, and the results of that, that chain reaction up until the third judgment. Right. The third judgment is called the day of great judgment, Yom Adin Agadol, and that is going to be at the end of history as we know it. The transition from uh, the way the world is today to the way the world will be when it finishes its cycle which, as we said, it's supposed to be a 6,000-year maximum. We're in the year 5,783, so uh, we're getting close. But, uh, okay. um, but, that, but that by, when that happens and the world is now come to a transition point, the coming of the Mashiach is a big transition point. The coming of the Mashiach is not, the, it's not eternity, but it's a transition point because it's a transition when the Messiah comes, the Mashiach comes, so 
the truth is clear. And, and that's why it's not the same thing as today. Today, if you act righteously, that means that you have um, seen through the lies that can fool you. When the Mashiach comes, everyone's going to do the right thing because it's going to be obvious. Nobody's going to go and say, oh, I hate those Jews. They're not going to say that because they're going to say, wait a minute. The temple, they'll, they'll see things. So, so you know, the, the challenges are in the world. We live in a world where truth is concealed. That's the world we live in today. And just to, just to, just to start by by uh, by politic by political rants, there is there is a, a, a teaching that says that the Mashiach will come when the generation is totally messed up. So the good news is we're getting close. I think we're there. <laughs> right there, right there. Really yeah, well, I, one more thing, real quick, if you don't mind. Yeah, please. For all those who are in the process of converting to become a Noahide or still Christians or, you know, Buddhist or what, whatever, just to make it clear, um, this, um, this judgment, how is that going to work out? L let's say someone has convert converted from Christianity, became a Noahide. Um, all the things that they have done in the past that they thought it was normal. And now we all realize, including myself, that we have committed a lot of sins. So a lot of people are asking me about this. What's going to happen to all of my sins in the past? That's, that's called tshuva. That's called tshuva. Tshuva is, is, is returning. And, you, and, and, and that's what a person can do. A person has to do that. A person's not going to be held accountable for negative things they did when they fix it up. Oh. Fixing up a person who does truth, it's the, it's the greatest thing in the world. So, yeah. So, so what happens is when you fix it up, you change, you change your past. You literally change your past. It's like those movies. But, like, like you know, when you, when you go, the, the, the way to make a good movie is get the character who you are kind of identify with. And the beginning, they're not so great. They're doing all these mistakes. And then they kind of get it. And they become what they're supposed to be. And you look back at all of the all of the earlier scenes, and you kind of understand, well, they made a mistake. That's why they did it, because they didn't really understand. Now they understand they're so amazing. So that's 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 the that's the chuba, that's the returning. That means a person says, I, I made mistakes and I fixed them up. That's even, even greater. So a person is not held accountable in any negative way for the negative things that they fix they fix up. Sign of great. Okay, so the things that people made a mistake, especially when they didn't know. Didn't well, know. that's refreshing. Yeah, yeah. Very important. Uh, Very important. Because the person, first of all, a person doesn't know. A person doesn't know. And this is this is an important topic in general because this is, this is really a question people ask me. But a person doesn't know they're considered to be uh, an accidental show gate or it's, it's not their fault because they don't know. Now, everyone says to me, wait a minute, let's say a person is raised by very bad people and they don't know good from bad. And this is the American judicial system is going crazy with this problem right now. Well, what could you say? They don't, they don't know you can't steal. They don't know you can't mug people. So there's, there's, there's two parts to this answer. One is, there is a certain barometer everyone has. It's called your soul. And, and it's really very hard to imagine that certain things people don't know are, are not okay. They become desensitized to it. They've committed enough crimes that they, they think it's, they, it doesn't, they don't feel it anymore. But this first is a barometer, so there's a certain level of moral basic moral understanding that a human being generally has, even if he's raised in a not in a negative environment. That's the first part of my answer. Second part of the answer, which is even is, is deeper, it's another level to this, is that wherever you start in life, 
you are constantly given the ability to grow from there. So, for example, let's say I have a guy who's raised as a thief. And so he was, he's got a, a long line of, of thieves from back in his ancestors. This, this, is, this, is how he, this is the guy who thinks this is how you make a living. You rip people off. But he has a point where he knows to kill someone that he can't do. So what happens is he gets tested on the point. So he goes to rob a bank and, he, and, the, and the guard wants to stop him and he says, I can't, I can't cross that line. Whatever the line is, when the person controls himself from the line, the battleground he knows is wrong, he'll mm-hmm. move up the next battleground. Uh-huh. I, I remember I, a lot. I, I remember I once told my a friend of mine, a guy when I was I was living in New York, I remember he came into the house and he's Telling me something um, about some, uh, something in the news or something. Like that. And I said to him, listen, the law called Lush and Hara, they had speech. I, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear this about this guy. And he looked like I was crazy. And Mary looked like, what? <laughs> the whole system's based on, on Lush and Hara. That's, why, that's how you sell People magazine. What do you mean? So, so what happens is, is that, is that it was far. It was a foreign concept to him, but but as you start to work on whatever level you know is right, and you and you do that, you move up to the next level. So when you start to be considerate to other, you know, everyone knows you should be a nice person, but you know, you go and ask someone, you say, "Listen, go ask anybody." Does nothing in, in, intentionally nice. You say, "You a nice person?" Yes, of course. I'm not saying you're not. What do you do that's not? And all of a sudden, you get this blank look. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't torture small farm animals. What, what, what have you done that's nice? Do something. Help someone every day. Think how I can help someone. It takes one second. It's one second. Really, seriously, every day, think to yourself, you know what? Being a nice person is not thinking I'm a nice person. It's actually doing nice things. No. And that was like that, you know, that, that 90s show Seinfeld. That was the whole thing. It was like the guys were like, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't want to help, you know? And they end it like when they, they, they don't, we don't help anybody. They're in their own little world. But, of course, they're nice people because they make a fun show, you know? But, but like to be a nice person means you do nice things. Now, how do you start that? Well, very simple. Tomorrow or even today, think I am going to consciously do one nice thing that I wouldn't have done before. And it could be so small. I'm conscious to do one nice thing. I go and I like this, just, you know, I, I see a friend of mine who like, you know, uh, you know, I bring, I bring him a fruit. Say, hey, you know, go to the head. Maybe hungry. Someone in your house. Don't wait for them to ask you, can I, can I have a drink? Say, hey, would you like a drink? A conscious act of kindness. Because when you do that, you're actually starting to build your, your greatness and push your parameters. And so if this friend of mine who, who couldn't imagine the idea of that's bad to speak neg- negatively about people... But if he would have started, and he, but he knows he should be a good person, he would start doing nice things to people. All of a sudden, he would develop, not all of a sudden, over time, he developed a sensitivity that saying something bad about someone is just not nice. Now he's desensitized. But that's how we, we sensitize ourselves. So a person needs to go and, and do actions that will actively bring them to the next level. So. Even if a person starts life like on, at a, a level of two, on a scale of one to ten, they start out as a two. Someone else was trained very well and they start life as a seven. No, they went to prep school and they, they're really nice. I don't know what. But the seven guy goes to an eight. And the two goes to a five. Who's greater, the eight or the five? Right? One guy starts like this, no anything he's made out of two. Comes who's a five? Hey, Bruce starts at seven. 
and a scale of one to ten, he moves up to an eight. Really, the guy is a five. He's actually technically greater because that is what they did to become that, right? Well, this guy was born with, you know, knowing, but with not knowing. So, so, so the answer, I, I, I'm reasonable taking this answer, Laura, is because a person doesn't know. They don't know. No. Now, but if you're a thinking person like you are, you start to think. So I say, wait a minute. I'm in this world. Well, how did I get here? Okay. Let's be a creator that created this. Hope nobody believes a, you know, a shirt popped into existence on its own. So thinking about it. And so thinking about, I know if there is a source to this world, what is what does this source want me to do? How am I supposed to act? And, and, and you start thinking. And when you start doing that, you eventually come to make the right decision. And then that's, that's an incredible positive merit that a person went and didn't know and then figured it out. That's a tremendous merit. And if a person tries, if you open your heart, it says like the eye of a needle, God will open it like a giant hole. You start the process, oh, I want to do the right thing, Start the process. All of a sudden, the gates open up. This person tells me that. This person tells me that. The things start to go. That's the, it starts in your heart. Open it up a little bit. You want to try. God will assist you. Assist you to go and to bring that in. Mm. Okay. Great. So let's go where in Nehemiah. So, so Nehemiah, as it says, now we're calling it Nehemiah because over time, it seems that whatever slight Quite flaw is that Nehemia may have had at the time. It, it seems, according to some opinion, that's what I saw, um, that it could be that, that was rectified. Now, Nehemia is the um, uh, Sarah Master. I think it's called the butler, but in the old days, the wine, serving the wine to the king was a big deal. Especially because the, the main process of getting rid of the king was to poison him. <laughs> so, so you needed a very trusted person to be his saramashkim, his, his pourer of the wine, his one who checked the wine, did everything else. So Nathemia was the uh, person in charge, the officer of the wine um, for the king. Now, who is this king? So the king is says here okay. Shnas Esrim it was the 20th year 20th year of who? as I say and this is where the one of the proofs what I just told you this book is is, is the same book as Ezra it's not a separate book we were talking about the king before, Arshasta, and now he's continuing. So before him, we said in the seventh year, the king Arshasta, Ezra went up, and now the 20th year is the story of Nehemiah. Now, who's Arshasta? The hard name to pronounce. That is the same king we said before that was Darius. Okay? Many people hold it was the son of, of, of Esther, the son of Achashverosh. Now, what's Akhashtashta? That is the name of Persian kings, right? Like, what's the name of Egyptian kings? Pharaohs, right? Nefke, Ramses is different. They're all called Pharaohs. So Akhashtashta is the name of the kingdom. The kings are all called that. But we are in the same king we we're talking about before in the book of Ezra. The king called Arius. Now, Yovesh, who is the one who let the Jews go back? The second year of his reign, though the prophet, we said last time, the prophet Haggai and Zechariah told the Jews, even though the temple was started way back in the time of Koresh, 18 years earlier, it was put on pause. And now, Haggai, the prophet Haggai and the prophet Zechariah said to people, don't wait for the permission. Just start building. God will be with you. And they started building. As we saw last time, 
messages were sent to the king and uh, to this, uh, uh, um, to the, to the, not to the original Koresh who stopped it, but now to this person, Daryavesh, the king Daryavesh, Persian. And he said, yes, let the Jews build. So we're in that same king, Dar- Darius, Daryavesh, and it's the 20th year of his reign right now. Okay. So now, Nehemiah is a, 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 a officer in the king's court. And that was what was, that's the way it was. They, they, as we saw in, in, uh, in the book of Daniel, you see that when the Babylonians took control, they took the leaders and the greats. They didn't want like, just the bum being their, uh, being their officer. They took the geniuses and the great ones, the leaders. They took uh, Nehemiah to be his office. Now, in verse 2, it says that Hanani, who was one of his friends, who was living in Jerusalem, because you remember, go back, let's get our, just our history straight here. Seventy years earlier was the Babylonian destruction of the temple. Buchanetzer destroyed the temple, exiled the Jews to Babylon. They were there in Babylon for a period of time. Fifty-two more years, Babylonian kingdom was removed, the Persian kingdom took power. The leading first two kings of Persia, the second one, the son-in-law, was named Koresh Cyrus, and he gave the Jews the right to go back to build the temple. Jews started to go and to build it, the Samaritans, who were not such good Samaritans, depends on, on your politics, uh, they went and they besmirched the Jews and the, um, and the king stopped the building of the temple. It laid partially built a number of years, I think, 15. And then, so now, Koresh, the king Koresh, Cyrus died. The next king, Achashverosh, the story of Purim, he was the king, and he said, Jews not going to build a temple, or kill all the Jews. His successor, Darius, Dayavish, one of many people we said is his son, and one of many people is the son of Esther, to even make him Jewish, which is strange. So he becomes the king of Persia, and when the Jews start building the second year, he tells them that the, the enemies of the Jews come and say, hey, they're building. He says, we could let them build. Fine. They finish building the temple. Four years, the sixth year of his kingdom, Jews finish the temple. The seventh year, we said, of his kingdom, Ezra says, I need to go and help the Jews. And Ezra goes and he establishes and he wakes them up, creates a spiritual revival because they're like this small group stuck there. And now Jews are there in Israel, have the temple, and now it's 13 years later. And now a Jew comes from Israel to Persia, and Nehemiah says to him, tell me, how is it going for the Jews there? It's just going terrible. Terrible. Okay? They are being persecuted. Now, there's some discussion about who was being persecuted, which Jews being persecuted. Simply put, I mean, because again, there's a problem, because if the king said they can go build it, so why, why is it bad for them? This King Darius was a supporter of, uh, of, of the Jews, so why was it bad? So you could either say that what happened was, like, he wasn't on top of it. He sent to them to go, but it wasn't like today where you can just go and FaceTime him, see what was happening, and there were problems, and he wasn't on top of it. That's the simplest explanation. It seems to be what, what most colonies understand. Some understand it a little differently. Some understand that there's really three groups of Jews here. There are the Jews that were remained at the time of the destruction of the temple, one group. Second group were the ones that went to rebuild the second temple. Right? Cyrus's decree. And the third one were the ones that went with Ezra. 
So some explanations to understand that the, the last two were okay because the governors in charge of them were favorable to them because they knew they were sent there to by the by the king. But the first group that were still the ones that had remained in the destruction of the Babylonian kings, they were under a different governor who was abusing them. So it's not clear exactly what. The simple explanation is, is that all of them had it rough, even though they were sent there by the king, but time passed. And some people learned it was only part of them that had it bad. But either way, what was happening was the... Um, the, the system is, is not working, and there is no walls protecting Jerusalem. A city in those days without a wall is in trouble. Okay, you need a wall. How, how do you protect it? So there was no wall. The king let them build the temple. He let them build the wall. Now it says, when Nehemiah heard this, he sat and he cried and he mourned. He fasted and he prayed to God. Okay, and now it takes us to this long prayer of what he says to God. Okay, and he talks about God's covenant with the Jewish people. You hear the prayers. And he prays and he, he says, we all we, 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 we want to repent for the sins we did. They have not keep the Torah properly and remember the covenant and which commanded to Moses and protect the Jewish people. And now the Jews want to do it do what's correct. You promised to bring us back from the exiles. We are your people, it says in verse 10, that you have redeemed. Now he says, please hear the prayer of your servant, verse 11, okay, and give us kindness. Now this is the part I want you to hear. The last verse in chapter 1. And give me in compassion in front of this man. Who is this man? King. This is very important. He prays to God that his request from the king should be granted successful. And this is crucial because, because when a person thinks, and this is very important in my way of introduction to the today's politics, you're not going to solve the problem from the politics alone. It's not going to happen. Because in the bottom line, there's a reason why certain things happen. Mm. Therefore, a person needs to go and to act properly, pray to God to, 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 that this should go well, and then make their actual physical effort. To make no physical effort is a mistake. God put us into this world. You have to go and you have to vote and you have to go and you have to make statements. You got to teach. You got to talk. and You got to expose lies. But to get into that without realizing the spiritual root to everything, that's not going to go. And so that's what Nehemiah does. He says, Praise to Hashem and says, now I'm going to make my physical effort of speaking to the king and, and let this be successful. Now, this is really, really important. And why it's so important, what I'm going to tell you now is a shocking statement. But it says, the sages say that the hearts of the king are in God's hands. What that means is that you, you, you can have a leader. Let's say you had a leader. I mean, this could never happen, obviously. But let's say you had a leader who was seen up. That obviously could never happen. Could it be? But let's say you had a leader who was not really fully mentally competent. And he's being manipulated by other people telling him what to say. And let's say, I mean, now it's never, never be, but let's say he was a, a career politician. And he just pointed at him. This is damn, this is terrible. And he just says the things that they want him to say. I said, wait a minute, this is dangerous. The puppet. The puppet. So does that mean that the, 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 the world gets blown up because somebody on one level, that's when you gotta stand up and make a statement. 
On the other hand, you got to realize that it's not an accident. God's running the show. Mm. How, how, how did you fall into the situation? What's your society believing that it's producing such a thing? And I said to you last time, the leader is produced by society. And I hate to say it. I hate to say it as, as somebody who's, you know, was proudly an American many years, you know, it's like Americans forgot how to think. Those so make sense. You got to or leave. act on thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. But it's kind of, they don't want to think anymore. Everything's in a Facebook post. You know, this is what I have to believe. These are the good people. These are the bad people. So what organization, yeah. So right, so so you're so the leader can't think. So what happens is is that it says the, the the hearts of the leaders is in God's hands, which means that yes, they have free will, and bad leaders are given to people when something might happen negatively. But it's not them only. There's global things happening here. That's why you have to come on to the spiritual reasons for the things before you make the physical effort to right. do the stuff. You must do the physical effort. But if you think that that's what it is, then, then you're on the wrong track. And you believe that this guy can, can control the world. He cannot. He cannot control the world. The world is controlled by God. And our actions and, 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 and the process of what we do allows for inappropriate leaders to be in those positions. Can I ask you a question, Rabbi? Yeah, please. Um, at, that, at the stage where you're at reading in, in Nehemiah, is that when uh, the assembly, Great Assembly, instituted the uh, Avbet, Din, and Nasi uh, roles? And can you explain the narrative? Was that was that was that a safeguard? Uh, uh, like, wasn't Nehemiah appointed uh, a governor uh, technically, and and yeah. uh, Ezra was uh, the 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 first Avbet Din, or or am I missing yeah. something? Nehemiah, Nehemiah was appointed. Nehemiah is also one of the men of the Great Assembly, and that starts from the time that they build a temple. So that's already been happening. This process of the of, of the members of the Great Assembly, and they do have they do have what's called the the, the Nasi, who is the leader, uh, and and then they have Abbas, and who was the 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 head of the court, and and you always see in the Torah. I mean, like in, in America, the whole yeah they had the prophets that that the the the, the, the you know backed up the like the the the, the kings like I know uh, back to Solomon and. Uh, uh, David, uh, did they not have prophets that uh, uh, assisted them for sure? But uh, the system changed somewhat uh, in the Second Temple, yeah? And well, I, was it a safeguard? We really was my question uh, politically. So, so the prophets have a certain role. Their role was always to exhort the people to act properly. The prophets cannot decide the law based on prophecy. Very important point. The prophecy is not the judicial system. America's system of the checks and balances is based on the Torah system that there were different roles. The king had a role. He was one area. The, 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 the Kohanim, that priest had a role. The judicial system, which was the courts, um, that was not based on prophecy. There were prophets in the courts, but they couldn't decide the law based on the prophecy. They came in and said, God told me this is the law. We don't listen to them because once Moshe gave the Torah, no prophet could come along and change the law. That's a clear statement in the Torah, right. which, is, which is a prof, the problem with many religions. That, that can't happen as you cannot change it. So the, the judicial system was the Sanhedrin. So, so the men of the Great Assembly, the Sanhedrin existed from the time of Moshe. The court is in the entire Moshe. If Moshe was the 71st, he had 70 elders and he was the 71st. Which is the way the court was set up. So that Sanhedrin was always there. The Ben of the Great Assembly was a one-time system of 120 sages that would make the proper fences to the Torah and they would have a, a, a life stature as the Ben of the Great Assembly. And then they'd go back to the normal rule 
of the 70 elders. The reason why they set it up like that was because they needed to institute certain things. We do see, we'll see later on. Nehemia has one of the very early main institutions of the Medjugorje Great Assembly. In, in the book, Pirkei Alvos, FX of Our Fathers, Men's Great Assembly had a few statements they used to say. And right. One of them was to create a fence around the Torah. Now, this is a very important question. The person says, wait a minute. Rabbi, you told me you can't add anything to the Torah. How can you make a fence to the Torah? And we'll see. Nehemia does. Nehemia makes this fence called Muksa. Muksa is the law on Shabbat. Let's say I cannot turn on a light. I can't turn on electricity. I can't turn on a radio. There's a law. You can't take the object that's forbidden and move it around on Shabbat. One of the reasons you might forget and turn it on. Now, that law is not from the Torah. That is a rabbinic law. But how do the rabbis make that law up? Again, you will see, is the one who, who him and he was the, the, the sage who, who, who promulgated that during the minute of the Green Assembly because he saw the people were getting lax in the laws of Shabbat. So he made a fence around it to guard it. So how did they have the right to do that? The answer is a verse in the Torah. The verse in the Torah says, Asu mishmer, mishmer, to make a fence around my Torah, God says. God says he exhorts the sages to make a fence around the Torah. Because if you have something very precious, you need to protect it. So that's not called adding to the Torah. That's called the creating of safeguards. That in the Torah itself was given permission to and commanded to the sages to do. The verse in, 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 in Leviticus, in Bayikra, says, make a fence around my fence. And therefore they were allowed, that's not, now it's not called adding to the Torah. It's called protecting the Torah. I, I, I don't know if I told you this. One time I was, I was explaining this. I was giving a class in San Antonio. I was in, I was in Texas. And the rabbi uh, sent me to, to give a class someplace. And, um, and what happened was I was playing this idea. And I had, I had this, this cheap junkie watch. And I said to the guy, I said, listen, let me explain to you the idea about making a fence. See this watch? I think I'll put it down. This watch cost me like 10 bucks. So, okay, I'm leaving it. Now, if this watch costs I don't know, Rolex, and it cost me $10,000, I wouldn't just leave it on the table, right? If something valuable, you guard it. So the Torah is very valuable. God said, create the protection around. That was the story that in the class I told. The next day, the rabbi gets a call from the guys who sent me to speech. He said, the rabbi, of course, was amazing yesterday. We loved him. He was great. He really knows how to get a point across. He left his watch in my office. So I proved my point. It's something junky you forget. It's something valuable you protect. So that, that's what it, what's happening here. So the men of the Great Assembly, one of the things they had was to create a fence around the Torah. And that's what you were asking, Dan. That, that is correct. They created safeguards that were not there before because they saw the people were on a lower spiritual level and they needed protection. Okay. Let's, what time? I think I'm going to have to call it because it's kind of late here. And we have, yeah. Okay, so what we've seen so far in chapter one is that Nehemiah is going to go to the king and he's going to ask him to grant him his wish. His wish is going to be to go into Jerusalem, to build the wall around Jerusalem, to protect. Let's see what happens. Out Nehemia, as as Daniel said so so correctly, is creating a protection both physically and spiritually as the proper leader. Okay, any questions, ideas, comments?